We're now going to think about, in session three, its future challenges. So who better to start us off than Maurice Whelan from the JRC, who's uh, an expert in the new approach methods. And uh, so I hand straight over to him to uh, do the first presentation after the coffee break. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, thank you very much, Chairs. Um, thank you very much to the organisers for this very kind invitation to talk to you today. Um, you know, I'm very uh, um, happy and, and value gr greatly our cooperation with EFSA, so it's, it's lovely to be part of this event. So, um, I'm from the Joint Research Centre. Um, we're the in-house science, uh, science service of the European Commission, and we offer impartial scientific uh, advice to the policy-making cycle. Um, my own domain in systems toxicology, really, um, we're interested in supporting a whole host of different uh, chemicals policy areas, uh, and also in, in um, supporting policy in relation to reducing our reliance on animal testing. And we genuinely believe that we can uh, move towards a win-win, where we can really uh, exploit uh, new approaches to um, hazard assessment uh, using new technologies and new tools, uh, and also avoid uh, our reliance on animal testing. Um, Part of my unit is also uh, an integral part of the unit is the European Union reference of Barry for, to, for alternatives to animal testing. And there you can see our, our mandate really starting from, from guiding research right through to promoting international acceptance. And, you know, I, I genuinely believe that um, from our perspective, um, you know, dealing with uncertainty and, and being able to describe uncertainty and, and, and uh, um, characterize it um, really influences all these steps. It can target uh, research uh, into areas where we want to potentially reduce uncertainty. Um, it can really um, inform how validation should be uh, uh, carried out. And also, um, it's a critical part in um, ultimately uh, regulatory decision makers accepting these new approaches. So I'll be returning to some aspects of that as I go through. Um, you know, we look very carefully at how um, alternative approaches can be used in different uh, different regulatory endpoint areas, and we produce these strategy documents that you might be interested in, what analyze really all of the information requirements across different pieces of European legislation, um, and then talk about how we can possibly address these information requirements or satisfy them uh, using different alternative approaches. Um, also, we've just um, published our annual report on the validation, regulatory accept uh, development, validation, regulatory acceptance terms of methods. It only came out yesterday, so please uh, download that if you're interested from our website. So, look, let's 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 get on to the the, uh, the meat of the dis discussion. Um, you know, it's a very simplistic representation of con um, conventional toxicology, but essentially, it is it is very much represented. If we're taking a chemical, we're uh, treating an animal model, and, and we're observing usually through histopathological effects what happens. Um, you know, traditionally, we haven't been that interested, uh, and even regulation hasn't required us to be that interested in understanding um, why a chemical uh, is is toxic uh, uh, under certain conditions. And of course, you know, um, if I take from the WHO IPCS uh, guidance, you know, we, we can identify um, all these sources of uncertainty that are associated with this conventional toxicological testing. Um, and I won't go through them all, but they're, they're kind of familiar, aren't they? Um, and it, it, it's funny, over the years, as, as uh, um, risk assessment has, has evolved, you know, uh, identifying and characterizing these particular sources of uncertainty and has become very rigorous, as I said, to a point where we're very familiar with them. You know, sometimes I wonder whether, you know, if 40, 50 years ago when animal testing was proposed as the way of assessing toxicological effects in humans um, as an animal model, and, and we had been that explicit about the sources of uncertainty, would people would have been so ready to accept animal testing as kind of the default? Uh, I wonder, you know. So, um, really what we're, we're wanting to do is, is, is compare that landscape with a new predictive toxicology paradigm. So let's talk about the, 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 the elements or ingredients to that predictive toxicology paradigm. First of all, you know, a lot of the test data that we're getting now is not observational data from uh, animals. We're not looking at the effect that we're actually concerned about. We're, we're, we're uh, getting data from uh, cell culture systems, from 3D uh, tissue models uh, with an omics readouts on the end, end points. We're, we're looking at functional uh, um, uh, readouts and so on. So a whole host of new types of, of test data. We're also um, you know, looking at um, 
chemoinformatics and computational approaches where we can use you know, our knowledge of quantum mechanics to actually um, simulate a, a interaction between endogenous and, and exogenous uh, chemicals. And we can also you know, use the information we have uh, on chemical structure uh, from analogs and so on um, uh, very systematically. Um, we also, as Harvey uh, alluded to, was you know we have got PBBK modeling. We we can look at, at ADMI and, and TK and, and, and distribution and so on. And not only is that uh, of importance for describing the, the the toxicological profile of a chemical, but it also informs the in vitro part of the story. You know, are we using relevant uh, concentrations in our in vitro systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very importantly, in this new uh, predictive toxicology paradigm, is theory, theoretical toxicology. It's really the understanding of uh, mode of action, mechanistic processes, adverse outcome pathways, whatever you want to call it, but bringing our, our, our understanding of these processes into play. And by combining all those things, we predict safety. So we're not observing uh, um, a toxicological effect and extrapolating to human. We're actually using this primary data sources combined with our knowledge about toxicological processes to really predict uh, something. And so that is essentially the predictive toxicology paradigm. Now, that's all wonderful. We're all giving each other high fives at predictive tox conferences, but when you start bringing this to decision makers, this is usually what the reaction you get. Um, usually you get all of those reactions. Um, and uh, this is where we're at now. This is where the rubber hits the road. If we genuinely believe that we can predict things that are useful to decision makers, how can we uh, really address all of this um, disorientation, bewilderment. Um, and I genuinely believe it's through you know, looking at uncertainty um, is, is where we'll, we'll make some, some impact. So the first thing we try to address as a community, let's say, at the OECD, um, is uh, basically trying to come up with a framework to put all this together. Because everybody, and from a scientific perspective, working on, on predictive toxicology has their own way of describing what they're doing. And we all know that one major barrier for any type of, of uh, um, decision maker is that if you can't explain to them how you're arriving at your prediction, then it's, it's, you know, you're not at the races. So this framework, uh, Integrated Approaches to Testing Assessment, has emerged, um, and you can read the definition there. Uh, but here, key words are, you know, it's, it's, it's a framework that's looking at hazard identification, characterization, or safety assessment. It's for a specific chemical or a group of chemicals. Um, it's strategically integrating and weighing relevant existing data. Um, and uh, also, very importantly, targeting the generation of, of data uh, to inform decision making. So that's the emergence of this framework to try to put some shape on the predictive toxicology paradigm. So that's a good, a good first step. Now, continuing uh, those discussions at, at, at OECD um, is you know, identifying clearly what are the elements, what are the bits and pieces that make up an IATA. So we have the information sources. We have uh, computational models, as I mentioned before. We have OECD test guidelines, possibly. But here, uh, the, 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 the information derived from those uh, is possibly secondary if it's an in, in vivo result, for example. We've got non-standard tests, in vitro tests, and so on and so on. Then we've got ways of combining that information, grouping and read across, testing strategies, sequential testing strategies, weight of evidence. We want to inform uh, both the uh, you know, gathering of, of, of data plus the combination and the integration of that data through understanding of biological processes, toxicological processes. And then we can bring in and layer into that uh, the, the um, biokinetic information. So they're the bits and pieces. They're the building blocks, if you like, of, of IATA went further then to say, okay, well, it's not just the building blocks that define it. We, want to need, we need to be clear, uh, again, what, 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 what is an IATA. So first of all, it needs to address a, a defined endpoint of regulatory concern. That's been often a problem in the research programs that I've been involved in, where people don't, people don't even know what they're predicting. Uh, and, and particularly if they're predicting something, it might have really not a, a, a direct relevance to what a, a decision maker is really concerned about. So being explicit about the the really the health effect that you're, 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 you're targeting. A defined purpose, you know, is it for classification labeling? Is it for safety assessment? Is it a cosmetic ingredient? Is it et cetera, et cetera. Um, very importantly then, description of the rationale uh, and the mechanistic basis, um, really un underpinning the blueprint, uh, the logic, the rationale under the IATA. Um, description of information sources, um, how information sources then are integrated, the prediction model essentially, and very importantly, um, you know, this crept in. 
uh, a description of the unknown uncertainties. So the good news is it did get in there. Uh, so predictive toxicologists with all their fancy tools actually recognized it. The bad news is not very much underneath that, <laughs> other than to, as a placeholder, and that's what I'm going to try to deal with today. So this has now actually led to an OECD guidance document. This is an internationally agreed you know, guidance on how we can begin to describe um, integrated approaches to testing and assessment. And it's a fairly ambitious scope here. It's to promote consistent evaluation and application of IATA within OECD member countries by providing guidance on a harmonized approach to reporting. And we all know, it might seem very banal, but we know that the first obstacle we need to overcome when we're trying to bring new approaches into play in decision making is that they're well described in a structured way so that people can really uh, 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 understand what's being proposed to them. So we're making progress. Um, linked to that is a reporting template, again, uh, sort of uh, teasing out those principles. And again, we're seeing here at the end uh, um, the point on known uncertainties associated with the, with the application. Uh, how key assumptions related to the model structure and information sources translate into prediction uncertainty. So all the, the right language and, and, and uh, um, intent is being uh, illustrated here. Interestingly enough too, and this is kind of I suppose a, a particular uh, aspect of predictive tox, is, is a provision for describing how predictive the approach that you're your mate, your, 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 your proposing is in terms of comparing it with uh, existing data, existing examples, uh, chemicals you know the answer for, etc. So, as I say, that last component there on uncertainties is about as far as we've got as a predictive toxicology community. So then it's kind of a, you can go left or right, you can reinvent the wheel and try to deal with the whole uncertainty issue, or you can come back and say, well, hang on a sec, there's a lot of smart people, most of them in this room, who've already thought a lot about this. Not necessarily in the context of predictive toxicology, but you know, conceptually we're very much on the same page here. So what I've done here is I've taken, I hope EFSA don't mind, um, the uh, uh, draft uh, uh, of, the, of the opinion on uncertainty, and I've pulled out just one thing, where it's the typology of uncertainties. So if we take this kind of generic um, typology, and here we're talking about uncertainties associated with inputs, you know, can we begin to use this as a way of exploring um, p uh, sources of uncertainty in this, in this new toolbox that we have? So we can begin to do that. We can start looking at our in vitro tools. We can look at um, you know, the, the human relevance of these tools. Do these tools reflect human biology? Um, we can look at the measurement uncertainties, challenging sometimes in the high content outputs, the, the, the omics and so on, but it can be done. We can come up with metrics for measuring uncertainty and so on. Sampling uncertainty and things, uh, all about the treatment and dose response in vitro and so on. Um, uh, distribution uncertainties, uh, um, we, we can relate there. Then we've got our, our computational models and our, our predictive tools based more on, on computational chemistry. Um, again, there we can, we can begin to apply some of these uh, um, types of uncertainty or, or understand them in, in, in the context of those types of uncertainty. And same with the PBK modeling. There, for example, here we're talking about kind of hybrid systems because uh, most PBK models, and Harvey I'm sure would agree with me, are based on actually measured quantities are assumed quantities. So it's a mathematical model, but a lot of the underpinning data is actually generated experimentally. So there, we, again, we can describe the impact of variability and so on on the actual model predictions. So now we've got a bit of a framework to work on, and we can really go through now systematically these components and describe uncertainties associated with inputs. Now, another piece of good news is that, in fact, um, in terms of the, the building blocks, a lot of this has already been done. So take QSAR models, for example. We have a, a JRC QSAR model a database with hundreds of QSARs. Um, but very importantly, they're described following already established OECD validation principles. And these principles reflect you know, the, the, the desire that uh, for these tools to be used in regulatory processes and decision making, um, the regulator needs to know how does it work, what's it's built of, what does it perform, what's its applicability domain, what has its limitations, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, a lot of these kind of input uncertainties, if you like, are captured, uh, maybe not as explicitly as I'm saying, but in, in here. So it, this kind of systematic evaluation of these tools is being done. And the good news also for in vitro systems, we're doing it as well. 
um, again, in vitro systems have been systematically described in terms of their performance, their components, their scientific relevance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and recently at the OECD, was, was, I think was a major breakthrough, was, that, was an acknowledgement that we have so many in vitro tools today that aren't test guidelines, we really need to get seriously serious about trying to facilitate their inclusion in decision making. So this was a guidance document to say, look, at least let's describe them in terms of what they are and how they perform so that they can be used in context of an integrated assessment and testing strategy. So we're, we're definitely on the right road. Now, I put this slide in because um, I actually created a slide about two years ago um, in discussions about validation of methods and new methods and validation paradigm needs to change and it's too slow and et cetera, et cetera. And, and what I was acknowledging was that, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, that we have, we have principles that are scientifically based. You know, if you can't reproduce your result, I'm not going to believe you. Okay, I, I, you know, that, that, that's, that's kind of a principle that we have. If it's not relevant mechanistically I, and biologically plausible, I'm not going to believe you. So these are, these are principles that as scientists we, we, we cherish. However, the way we've been doing validation and the purpose of validation, that's something that's subjective. That's something that should evolve, okay? Now, generally speaking, when we're doing validation, we want to characterize reliability and relevance. Now, reliability in this context, OECD language, is more about reproducibility, technical reliability. And relevance is all about scientific relevance, predictive capacity, etc. But what hasn't been addressed really is validation as a process for characterizing uncertainty in in vitro systems. And I think that's where opportunity lies. So, you know, this idea of validating a method so that it's then standalone and predictive of, a, of, a, of an endpoint in an animal, forget about it. Now we can see validation as a process of informing uh, this uncertainty, okay, qualitative, quantitative. And, you know, we can do that. Validation studies, in a sense, do that, but that's usually the information that's in the annex or left out or something, you know. So let's go back to our... Um, EFSA guidance guided, you know, uh, consideration of, of, of uncertainties and predictive tox systems. And here now, you know, that the, the, there was these other typology, other types of uncertainty associated with how I combine the inputs. Some of from an IATA, from a predictive tox, this is where, you know, uh, the things get very interesting. This is our predictive model, you know. Um, and again, there are many different types. But as I said before, we can talk about weight of evidence models, and, and a lot of uh, elo eloquent speakers talked about that just a moment ago. Grouping and read across categorization, testing strategies, and many other boxes. These are kind of model uh, uh, designs that we can, um, we can, of course, get very probabilistic, and we should. We talk about Bayesian, and we can bring that into play. Um, and very importantly, I bring back in here again the models in, in modern um, you know, predictive toxicology. Um, for me to have credence have to have biological plausibility, a biological base. So therefore, we, the, 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 the um, uh, theoretical understanding of biology is very important in these models. And again, we can go through these and talk about, well, ambiguity, luckily, you know, as I said, we're dealing with in terms of describing these uh, approaches for, for doing predictive modeling. Um, but, you know, the words aren't exactly matching, but the structure of the assessment could be you know, the construction of your model. What was the rationale behind it, you know, um, uh, and, uh, et cetera. But uh, you, you get where I'm going with this. Uh, by the way, this, I've never done this, actually applied <laughs> this. This is uh, still at the con conceptual level, but um, I'll see how you think about it, and if you like it, then I might do it. So I, I go back to the WHO thing, because, um, you know, they're, 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 you know, as much as we're appreciating that there's a convergence here, and this is exciting, you know, um, on the other hand, there are differences, and we need to appreciate those too. And, you know, I just pulled out this because what's interesting here is mode of action is kind of on the outside. It's a kind of a, often a nice to have, not necessarily need to have. I'm generalizing. Um, and it's, it's indicating that you can basically do your hazard assessment, and, and you may or may not have this component. Okay? But What's fundamentally different between, the, let's say, traditional animal-based approaches to hazard characterization risk assessment is that, you know, as I say, this is kind of an optional, uh, you know, uh, uh, possibility. Whereas in, in predictive tox cases, um, it's essential. And let me give you just one little example about how we do our business to convince you that without this explicit mode of action knowledge being put out there up front, we're not at the races. Okay, this is how we design in vitro assays today. 
Okay? The old days, we used to take cells and we'd throw positive chemicals and negative chemicals on it and we'd do a, a Cooper statistic and say, oh, look, it's 83% predictive of carcinogens. You know, nobody could explain why, nobody believed you, but, you know, that was it. Forget about that. Um, what we want to do now is not even think about toxicology, we think about biology first. We think about the physiological pathways that matter to us as human beings, as different species. And from there, we, we speculate or are based on evidence and understanding that to perturb those pathways is a bad thing. Okay? Then you start by selecting a biological model that encompasses or expresses or recapitulates that model. And it's a fitness for purpose. It might be a humble 3T3 fibroblast, or it could be a Rolls-Royce stem cell, whatever. It doesn't, what matters is that it captures the thing that you're interested in. Okay? Then we select uh, pathway-specific biomarkers and positive chemicals to be able to characterize the dynamic of that pathway. And I mean dynamic in terms of temporal response of that pathway. Um, and then you eventually start getting more engineering-like until you turn up at the hospital. Now, I'm seeing Mel, uh, 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 sorry, Harvey nodding there because uh, Mel Anderson, his, his, his good friend and colleague, is a guru at this. Um, and, uh, but this is predictive. Talk. So this is just an in vitro assay of a new iota. But it just shows you that if I don't have this biological reasoning at the front, I don't get anything out at the end. That's the design process. Now... <laughs> That all looked very simple, I was thinking. Um, loads of people say to me, Morris, you're dreaming. It'll be hundreds of years before we'll ever be able to define all of the physiological pathways and toxicity pathways, and we'll never there, and in the meantime, we'll all be, you know, dying of chemical whatever. So, but in fact, I, I refute that, because if we, if we put together all the knowledge in this room about toxicology and, and biology, it'd be amazing. We know an awful lot of things. The problem is we can't see the wood for the trees. We've got thousands and thousands of peer-reviewed papers, but we can't assimilate all of that knowledge, and particularly in the risk assessment process. So George Dasson gave me this to illustrate that. He says, this, it was words at the Eurotox uh, meeting uh, just a couple, of months, or a couple of weeks ago, was um, basically this represents 60 years of toxicological research in developmental and reproductive toxicity distilled down by experts into 25 key mechanisms, and not only that, He'll actually tell you the chemical properties, the motifs, the structural features that would be associated with those 25. Right? And not only that, he even made a statement of uncertainty. He said, you know what, I think that covers 80% of the toxicological domain of developmental and reproductive toxicity. So when I hear somebody of his stature saying that, I'm thinking, you know what, this is a tractable problem. You know, we can we, just, that's how we imagine. So what about the extra 20%, etc.? So. Of course, this leads me on to the AOP thing a little bit, is basically that, you know, we can go systematically about gathering knowledge about toxicological processes. And I won't go on to much of this because it was mentioned in the past talks. We can build knowledge bases. We've built one. It's publicly accessible. We can crowdsource scientific knowledge um, and, 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 and assemble it into currently are these kind of very structured, uh, essentially documents with nested articles that describe not only the key events but the causality between them. And not only that, but uh, thanks to IPCS and WHO and Betty Meek in particular, we can actually talk about weighing evidence in that causality. Is there biological plausibility? Is there empirical evidence? And we can begin to codify that. So it is already crosstalk at lower levels between these communities. Um, and very importantly, we can then actually say, you know what, if I'm going to use that knowledge as a blueprint for my IATA that somebody's going to accept, let's make sure that that knowledge is you know, as solid as it can be. And that's why at OECD we've already foreseen going through a process of, of, of regulatory acceptance of knowledge which is quite, quite a different concept, isn't it? Before you've ever built a, an IATA or designed a method or tested a chemical. Very importantly is versioning. Our knowledge emerges all the time. We've heard that, heard that in, the, in the previous talks. So let's make sure that whenever we're deciding, do we all agree, do we all agree that we know what version we're, we're agreeing on? And you know, what's exciting is there are lots and lots of these AOPs emerging. And what's beautiful is, because we all know, and we've, it has been anecdotal evidence for decades that key events are shared between different toxicological pathways. This allows us to actually visualize it, compute it, see it emerge, where your key event is my key event. 
but you work in reproductive toxicity and I'm more interested in reprodu uh, uh, repeated dose toxicity. But God, our, our key events we have in common, let's talk to each other. You know, you're a, a, a looking at a, a pathologist. Well, you have a lot of, of knowledge at th that end of the, of the scale. You're a molecular chem up here. So everybody can contribute to this story. So just to conclude, IATA, it's an international standard for reporting hazard and risk assessment and risk assessment approaches based on the integration of predictive toxicology methods. I hope that you've seen uh, the light in the sense as like I've seen is that, you know, here are communities coming together. Here's a potential for the predictive toxicology community to learn from this community and vice versa and not uh, basically reinvent the wheel when it comes to now dealing with describing uncertainty um, and really adapt and apply the excellent guidance that we have in the conceptual thinking. Very important to note, however, is that there is a fundamental difference between predictive tox approaches and the more conventional approaches. And that's that the mode of action has to be center stage. You have to have it up front, otherwise you're not going places. And you know, this is kind of the, the point I was ultimately trying to make. That you know, unfamiliar uncertainties, stem cells and things and all these things that, that kind of freak regulators out. If we start taking the systematic approach to identifying, describing, following this guidance, understanding, then these will become familiar uncertainties. Just like in the traditional conventional approach to animal testing, we'll get, we might not be able to eliminate them all, but we'll be able to, to do our business uh, understanding them. And that's where I think, you know, modern validation, progressive validation, that validation that my organization is responsible to. I'll leave you with the final thought. Imagine if we managed to do all that, we got familiar with the uncertainties, identified them, quantified them. We all get, get getting comfortable now at the fact that we can begin to say probabilistically that if we measure a, 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 a hazard profile of a chemical upstream in terms of its inhibition of key functions, etc., etc., and we can probabilistically relate those to apical endpoints, the things that we're concerned about as regulators, we might actually, con you know, um, evolve to a system of describing chemical toxicity uh, in a completely different way. And, you know, I just freaks out a lot of my policy making friends in Brussels, but I say, you know, let's keep calm, we're not going to do it overnight, but, you know, that's where, that's where we might be going with this. Thank you very much. Now we've got time for a few, que a couple of questions. So I think <coughs> was there somebody with their hand up. Microphone's not working. Yeah, like, Dead as a dodo, is it? Can I try this other one? Yeah. Is this one work? This one's working. <laughs> yes. Can we throw this one away? It's useless. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you for the very inspiring and interesting talk. We've got a few minutes now for questions. So are the questions from the audience? Yes, please. Can we have a functional microphone over here? Thank you. Is this working? Is this working? Yes. Yes, thank you. I'll use it, I'll use it next then. Yes, my name is Nico van Belsen, Director General International Dairy uh, Federation. And excuse me for a very naive question because I'm not a toxicologist. But ILSI, where I used to work, has done a lot of work on threshold concept. How does your mechanism or, or, or your approach, in, does it incorporate threshold effects? And if, if so, how does it work out? If you can explain simply. Uh, if we mean threshold effects as opposed to TTC, threshold effect. Um, yes. if, if you're talking about in terms of capturing that in, in a description of a, of a toxicological process, motive, I mean, um, uh, the framework is, is agnostic to, if you like, um, details of the process. So if, if um, you're, you have information um, to be able to describe a toxicological process to, this, to the extent that you're able to be quantitative, you're able to describe, um, I mean, I know I, I'm fed up doing AOP talks, and I think most people in the audience probably are fed up of AOP talks as well, but, um, you know, the, 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 key, the key here is being able to describe this causality in this, in this process. And so 
the more quantitative information you have, well, qualitative as well, you can say, look, these, these are key events. This definitely causes that. That's a qualitative statement. Then you start saying, well, is it a threshold effect? I mean, is it a cumulative effect? Is it a C-max effect? Is it an AUC? You know, that, that language um, is then incorporated into the description of these key event relationships. So the framework foresees that. Now, the million dollar question, to be honest with you, and a lot of people, let's say, who would be, be, be skeptical of this is that they might agree that qualitatively we can do a fairly good job at describing key events and, 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 and causality between them. But are, will we be ever be able to do a quantitative, you know, or come up with a quantitative description? And, you know, my point is simply, well, you know, it is hard. But, you know, we haven't really been asking that question. We haven't been asking researchers to actually go in and listen, will you measure Will you measure the, the degree of protein binding that you need to you know, activate dendritic cells and, and so on in a skin sensitization pathway? Could you go and measure that, please? Um, and they, they can. They probably will. You know? So um, yes, it can be incorporated in, but it's all based on, on the scientific research knowledge that you have. This is just what I call, there's nothing ma magic about this. It's a knowledge management tool. It's a way of being able to take information from hundreds of papers that a regulator will never be able to read. You know, you know the thing, the guys, I was 35 years in the field of liver toxicology. You know, they, they aren't the people building the predictive toxicology systems. We need to be able to capture that knowledge, qualitative and quantitative, distill it, curate it, peer review it, and then make it available in a, in a, in a form that non-experts, the person who didn't spend 42 years studying that one key event, is, are able to use in a predictive toxicology context. Okay? Okay, one, one more question, and then we must move on. Oh, look, sorry, two more questions, we'll let you off. Two short questions. Like a short answer, so yes. I'm not very good at that. There was somebody over there as well. Uh, I'm uh, Wopke van der Werf, Wageningen University, Netherlands. Um, I, I, well, I'm a scientist and I'm a skeptic, and your talk makes me actually feel uh, pretty septic, skeptical uh, because it sounds to me like um, you take detailed information, uh, you put it into a complex system dynamics model, and you will predict outcomes. And I'm well, we, we've seen lots of examples in the past where that has not worked in the 1970s with world models, with ecosystem models. Uh, even though the, the knowledge of what goes on in ecosystems is, is, is very good mm. and how everything works together to produce outcomes, uh, yeah. we, 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 we don't make it. So yeah. what makes you so, uh, so positive? Um. Well, you're making me think about what, what I must have. Maybe I was far too enthusiastic, but I, maybe it, it, I, I completely embrace, I, you know, I, I um, was trained in building complex you know, systems and I was doing system identification. So um, again, this isn't magic. If there, there are two ways this prediction, first of all, I'd say is, you know, pr prediction it has to be qualified with the uncertainty, you know. Um, Every risk assessment, to some extent, is, is, is predicting something or saying the likelihood of something will happen or not. So n nothing's different here. This is not a, if you buy into this, it doesn't mean you believe in determinism, deterministic systems and, and you know, everything, will, you'll always get the same answer, etc. Um, I mean, in these representations of processes, you're capturing what you know about the system. So you might know less or more about different elements of this process. Now, if you know a lot about the process and the process itself um, isn't overly stochastic or whatever, then you might be able to make a fairly decent prediction of what you're interested in. But if your evidence base is incomplete, it's not quantitative, you've got lots of holes in it and lots of uncertainties, lots of variabilities, well, then your prediction is going to be, you know, uh, that. So predictive toxicology isn't, isn't, doesn't mean precise and accurate. <laughs> It, it means, it means uh, you've got a data set that doesn't represent the health effect that you're, you're actually interested in, and you're trying to say something about the, the, the probability or possibility of that chemical being associated or, and causal of that. And I think uh, Harvey's slide with the third, you had the predicting safety or whatever, is, is reflective of that. It's, you know, and, and the... the the tradition has been, the thinking has been that if I have upstream information from an in vitro system like protein binding or cytotoxicity, I'm going to be far less able to say something about an apical endpoint than if I measure an observation, a histopathological observation in an animal study. 
because people think, oh, well, that's closer to the truth. But that's been really challenged, isn't it? It's been really challenged that maybe these familiar uncertainties have lulled us into this false sense of security, you know? Then, in fact, maybe measuring protein binding, we can show this for skin sensitization as, a, as an example, that being able to compute protein binding and make a prediction of skin sensitization is far more reliable than doing either the in vitro test or even the in vivo test. So we need to challenge uh, this. And, and so forgive me if the impression is that this is a perfectly deterministic, uh, constant, you know, easily predictable world. It isn't, but, but the framework, to, you know, uh, doesn't preclude bringing uncertainty and probabilistic thinking into play, that's for sure. Okay, I think we're almost moving on to the panel discussion now. Yeah, okay. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you very much, and we'll move on to the next speaker. <laughs>